And just like every other time, we're back. It's an amazing day to be great. I'm Charbel Milan. Today we got Chris de Blasio. And this is a time shared. So Chris, just to get you up to speed, this podcast is all about providing positive reinforcement to the people coming and listening. And the only way we can do that is by having people like yourself on. People who are out here innovating, changing the game, and paving their own way. So before we get things going, I just, you know, I want to give you a quick platform. Tell the people by yourself everything they should know before we get going. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Chris de Blasio. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Agency 850. We're an entertainment marketing company. We do a lot of stuff with product placement, product integration. We do a lot of branded entertainment stuff for movies and TV shows. Uh, I've been in the entertainment business for many years on both sides of the camera, both as an actor and a producer. I work as an executive producer, so I help high net individuals invest in movies and TV shows and serial entrepreneurs. So I've got several other companies that uh, that I uh, that I run as well. Sweet. So just trying to you know get things going right. How is it like transitioning from being an actor to now being an executive producer, owning your own company, being the CEO of, you know, Agency 850? Well, what's the transition like now that you've seen both sides? Well, that, that's an interesting story. So uh, I originally hail from New Jersey. I started out actually in advertising. I sold Yellow Pages. And um, when uh, when I made that transition out, I mean, I had some great sales training and, and you know, I... I uh, I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed the selling process, but I, I transitioned out. I went to the school for film and television in Manhattan. Fast forward to 2007, I moved out to LA uh, to, you know, to pursue more uh, more roles out out in Hollywood, and that was during the writer strike. Okay. So uh, what happened was uh, work was starting to dry up, but I've I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been able to just kind of figure out how to make a buck and build businesses and stuff like that. So instead of busting tables, which a lot of us actors usually do. I created a company, and so 2007, uh, when mobile, when uh, smartphones were coming out, right? It was back when the flip phones were phasing out. You had these smartphones coming out. Websites weren't fitting on these smartphones. So what I did was I hired a bunch of developers to create mobilized websites, and I sold it to everybody I knew in the entertainment business. And that's actually how our agency started. I started doing marketing for people out in Hollywood, and I was like, oh, this is great. At least I don't have to, I don't have to bust tables or you know anything like that. So I actually developed it, added more products and ser- services, and we just continue to grow. So it's been... Uh, it's been it's been a wonderful ride, really. Wow. So so you went out to LA, they were having the whole rider issue, and then you came back and I, I know exactly what you're talking about too. When you'd open an app or you'd attempt to open an app and it wouldn't work on the phone because you know the website wasn't up to speed. Yep. So what where did that whole idea come? Was it that you were trying to fix your own problem and you ran into wait a minute, I can sell this product or mm. was that always kind of the the gist. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So w- both being in the entertainment business, yeah, I was I was trying to solve an issue because I was like, man, I was like, I can't get my demo reel to play on this phone. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be really cool if like an actor, and this was when QR codes were big, you don't see those things anymore, they just started coming out, but you can scan the QR code and it goes to a website. Wouldn't it be really cool to put that QR code on the back of your resume or the back of a DVD box? And that's actually how it started. Whereas you can take your phone, scan it, and then you can show somebody, you know, the uh, the uh, trailer, if you will, or your demo reel. And that's actually how it started. And then eventually, you know, it was like, okay, well, we need to start really making these websites mobile optimized because a lot of people in the entertainment business images everything, right? And so so the idea kind of took off and, and it was this new thing back then is like, oh, well, it has to be mobile optimized. And, you know, with the whole Google thing, if your website's not mobile optimized, you know, you're going to get deranked and all this stuff. So the the concept really took off and you know i think in business you know you always want to keep innovating and and so that's the start of it and then eventually uh you know just turned into selling sponsorships into into movies and tv shows and doing the whole marketing end of it okay so before we dive way too deep into the business which we will just rewinding back to when you were out in LA when you know you came back here when you were pursuing being an actor what what exactly type of like roles did you try out for mm-hmm. like what was your thing were you like acting or not acting was it action or more comedy or what was your thing yeah so in new york i i mean i trained you know in in new york for for all different you know all different styles of of acting and and um one of the things that uh that i started out on was soap operas so um i was fortunate enough to get hired early on by abc and and i kind of bounced around on on some of the soaps and and had some smaller roles in some shows and 
So, but I've done, you know, I've been on CSI, I've done horror movies, I, I've done pretty much, pretty much all of them, um, suspense, stuff like that. And then when I hit LA, uh, because of the writer strike, I actually landed on the other side of the camera. So out of necessity, right, I started learning producing and I started learning, you know, how to get projects off the ground and funded and stuff like that. Okay, so for someone who's listening right now who's not completely up to speed with the whole writer strike thing, do you yeah. think you could explain that issue that was happening? Yeah, so back in 2007, um, it shows like The Office just stopped, right? And everybody was like, well, what's going on? Basically, there was uh, the uh, Producers Guild and the Writers Guild could not come to an agreement on certain things. And the, it's just it was crazy times back then because a lot of the shows, you know, they couldn't come to an agreement, so they just stopped. And what happened was, even in movies, if you look at movies back in 2007, 2008, they get a little wonky towards the end because a lot of times they had the staff writers and it was, you know, people were uh, on set and they were making changes and stuff. And then when the writer strike happened, you didn't have those people anymore. So now it was up to the directors and the actors to finish finish writing it out, right? And, and trying to figure out the storylines, the plot lines and everything like that. And so um, it was a lot of weird stuff was happening during <laughs> them because of, because of the writer strike. So it was like Game of Thrones movie edition. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, sweet. So obviously, you, you know, unfortunately due to that situation, you transitioned over to the other side, mm -hmm. the, you know, the executive producer side of things. So you work with a lot of aspiring actors, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming your crew and, and whatnot. When it comes to scouting out talent, scouting out an actor, is it more about does this person fit the role that we're trying to fulfill, that we're trying to quote unquote sell, whatever it is? Or do you, do you look for talent and, and see, okay, well, maybe certain traits about them aren't where they need to be and we can get them up to speed through training, but they have the talent. Or do you guys just kind of look for people who, who are ready, who look like they can hop on the scene and get up to speed? I, you know, I think- Or you I, personally, not yeah, you guys. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's a combination of both, right? So movies are made, they get launched because of the talent names attached, right? That's why people fund it. Because if there's a name talent attached that's been in the game for a while or they just have a huge following or they're hot right now, as a producer, we know that that's gonna put butts in seats. That's going to equal revenue, right? So credibility. it's gonna- Credibility. It's gonna make It's gonna make money, which I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna be able to, pay our investors back, right? And that's, and it's show business, right? So a lot of, a lot of, you know, actors and people starting out, just they don't understand that, right? It's, 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 that's where you got to get to. That's why it's so important for you, especially uh, above the line talent, being in front of the cameras to brand yourself, you know, especially now the game has flipped on its head. Like with social media, you can build a following and start building your own influence. Whereas before you had the gatekeepers, you had the studios that were dictating your career. Now you don't have to. So it's a great time to uh, not only be a filmmaker, but also be, you know, a talent in front of the camera because you're a little bit more in control of your destiny as before there was only a couple people that that could could kind of give you that those keys, right? See, it's very crazy that, that you mentioned that, how social media kind of changed the dynamic of, you know, the film industry and a lot of different industries. Do you think that's a negative, however? Because there's a lot of people who have big audiences, but I mean... They're talented, don't get me wrong, but had there not have been a social media platform, they probably would have not ever have been discovered, which Correct. from the standpoint of someone trying to get discovered is definitely a good thing. I'm glad that we have these tools, but from the standpoint of an executive producer, do you kind of think that a lot of people are kind of falling through the cracks because they don't have the social media following, so they're not necessarily getting the roles because people think they don't have the credibility, when in reality they could do way better in the role than the person that has the following, that whole aspect of things. Do you mm -hmm. think that the quote unquote clout is kind of uh, misleading that just because someone has a following, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best fit for the role? Well, you have opportunity now, right? So to answer the, the first part of the question is, is if you don't have a following, but you're really, really talented, well, you have the opportunity to build your following now, whereas before you didn't, right? Because you would audition and you'd get turned down, you'd audition, get turned down or whatever. It just, it wouldn't line up. You know, you go in for an audition, it happened to me a couple of times. Like I'd go in and then I wouldn't get the role and I'd see a blonde haired, blue eyed guy that got the role. I'm like, ah, how did that even happen? Right? So sometimes you cannot, you, you, you're, you're waiting on your big break to happen. Like you're, you're trying for it. Whereas now you can create your own content too. 
And so I encourage a lot of people that are trying to build influence or trying to build their audience. You got a phone in your pocket. You can get it. Cameras have gotten so much cheaper now that you can get a decent camera and record footage, pushing content. That's what it is. And that's how you build an audience. So it's just really consistent content. Consistent. It's consistent content. You even see this with a lot of the A-listers. You know, up until maybe a year and a half ago, Will Smith did not have an Instagram account. Matter of fact, I I knew when he came on, you know, like literally his first couple of posts. You see some of these bigger named A-listers now going to social media to start promoting because it, Hollywood's changing. It's different. You know, the whole idea of the movie star is changing because that could be an influencer with a hundred million followers, you know? Yeah, right. Never touched a movie scene in their right. life. Exactly. Wow. Okay. So you've experimented around with New York experimented with LA. Now we're here in Atlanta, right? Which industry have you found the most love from? And obviously Hollywood might have a bias because they're known for their entertainment industry, Hollywood, the dream. But just like you said, it's, it's kind of changing now. You can make it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So where have you found the most love and, you know, just kind of been able to really plant your feet and establish yourself mm -hmm. the best? Well, I mean, I've been in all the majors, right? So started out in Jersey, worked in New York, moved to LA, lived out there for a number of years, uh, and then moved to Atlanta. Each market's a little bit different, you know? So, um, I mean, I've received love in, in each one of the markets. I mean, I being now here in Atlanta, I mean, it's it's I love the opportunity here because the entertainment industry is still growing, right? New York's got its own thing. LA's got its own thing. But Atlanta has this, it's it's in a wonderful spot now where it can be whatever it needs to be. Whatever the whatever the entertainment business looks like, it, it it's different from everything else. And so as an entrepreneur and somebody that is is likes to be in the unknown and keep developing, it's just a great time. So I really, really uh, am loving it, you know, especially here in Atlanta. So it's kind of like a sweet spot. Yes. Okay, sweet. So, you know, we touched on being in LA and we touched on being in Atlanta, but one thing I wanted to, you know, kind of rewind a little bit is you said that you guys started with the whole QR thing mm -hmm. and whatnot, but was the plan always to start a business or were you kind of trying to work for a different company at first and that didn't work out and you eventually led and did your own thing. You know, it's funny. I, I always say I, I was, I'm an actor turned entrepreneur and I, I didn't, I didn't know what I, at first I was just trying to solve an issue. Like, cause you know, at first I was trying for my own stuff and then I was, I was like, wow, I could sell this and actually make money. And then it started, you know, it just kind of trickled from that and then became a business owner. Right. Um, so it just kind of developed and, and like, even now, like, you know, with the ad agency, you know, the way we are as an entertainment marketing company, a lot of these, a lot of the product placement dollars that we're, we're uh, launching these projects with really did stem out of my own frustration of dealing with investors or trying to get that investment money where I can go out to an advertiser and I can raise money through product placement so we have the initial funds. So I guess it was kind of like my selfish need to uh, have a vehicle that I can fund my own movies. Um, and that's how it started. And that's generally how, you know, I just started creating these businesses as it started with a need for me. And then I was like, okay, well, now we can offer this to other people because this is a product. This is something that people need. I mean, there's so many filmmakers out there that don't know how to raise that that dollar. They don't they don't they don't have these other out, you know, these relationships with investors or whatever. So, creating another way uh that we're able to offer to them, uh it just made a really good fit. Okay. So, how exactly does a person raise money through investors in the film industry? Mm -hmm. Like is it about selling the idea and convincing somebody that, you know, you can put butts in seats or is it about like, is it a network is what I'm trying to say? Or do you have to go out and find people and kind of pitch them your idea? So it's, it's a little bit of both, right? So with an investor, the, the biggest thing that they want to know is how they're going to make a return. Right. I mean, if you're if you're gr taking somebody's money, you better have a good plan on how to giving them back more. Right. Um, so understanding that because there are too many, there's too many times where uh, you've got a lot of these filmmakers that want to do passion projects and it's just something and there's no market. They haven't done any research or anything. And then heaven forbid, they finally convince a, an investor to give them their money, but then they burn the investor, which is not good. 
It, it kills it for everybody. So being a well-educated uh, producer and, and understanding that if somebody's giving you money, there should be some sort of return. There should be something to give back, right? So understand that. And then the second part of your question is, yes, building your market. If you don't have... Um, if you don't have connections to these investors, you need to go where they're at. Uh, you know, I always joke, I say, you know, nobody walks around with a sign around their neck saying, hey, I'm a film investor. You know, no one does that. These are these are CEOs. These are these are finance guys. These are people that have, you know, hand me down money, trust fund babies, whatever. Right. Made all their money in Bitcoin. Right. That's who these people are. You need to go where they go and then build your network that way. OK, so what, what exactly does happen if you burn out? Like, what is that like? Obviously, there's legal consequences. Obviously, things are in contract. But what happens? Like, what if they invest in you? Everything goes well, but tickets don't sell. Mm -hmm. And it's not your fault. I mean, could be. Not, not necessarily you, but could be the person's fault. Maybe they didn't market correctly. Maybe they didn't this, this, or that. But what happens? Yeah, well, that and that and in, in the movie industry, that's that's always like all pointing fingers, you know. Of course, like, right? oh, oh, it was marketing. It was a marketing problem. Oh, it was one fun problem. Or we didn't get the name that we wanted, right? So, you know, it's it's kind of hard to you know really pinpoint exactly. It it could have just been that it wasn't ready. It was released too early. There's so many times where, you know, I would work with with distributors and it's like, we love the concept. It's great. Just not now. No, the market isn't ready. So working with with people that have been in the industry for a long time, if you're new to the industry, you want to partner with somebody that that has the experience. You know, if you don't have the credits underneath your belt or you don't have the experience, get with somebody that does to mitigate those risks. Right. And that's what you want to do is you want to mitigate the risks as much as possible for the investor so you don't wind up burning them. OK, so it's almost like any under, any other industry. It's kind of like trends. Mm -hmm. What's in, what's not, what people are, you know, people are leaning towards all the Marvel movies right now. People are leaning towards, oh, it's the season for romance. So it's kind of like clothing almost any right. industry. Right. OK, so you guys do marketing. Right. So let's say that. Well, how does it work? It, would it be that I have my own film, my own setup, and I need you to help me get out there? Mm -hmm. Or do you guys do marketing towards investors? How does the marketing aspect work? Yeah, so uh, on the marketing side for movies, there's there's a lot of things that people don't think about, right? The front end marketing, so while you're in production, right, you want to have a marketing budget for PR, for publicity, something, right? And that entails doing like behind the scenes footage, doing EPKs, like electronic press kits, you know, getting getting the word out there that it's in production and you're going to need all that stuff, right? Because things, times have changed, right? The, 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 the old days of the Blu-rays and the DVD and side B when you flip it over and you get all the behind the scenes, it's not really happening so much anymore. What's the outlet is social media. So while you're in production, let's push a little bit of behind the scenes to start building your audience. Because what you're doing is you're generating attention even before the movie comes out and hype. I like that. Right? Okay. So so that's an important piece. And then the second piece is PNA, which is prints and advertising, which a lot of newer filmmakers don't even think about. It's the after the fact. When the movie's made, people need to know about it. So you need to have a budget and you need to have the trailers cut. You need to know your district. You need to know where your trailer is going to add. Are you taking out billboards? You're taking out, you know, the side of, you know, a, bill, a billboard on the side of a bus. Like, what is it? What is your marketing strategy? You have to have some sort of marketing strategy. To, and that goes for any product, right? It, it, it's anything. You need to have a marketing strategy behind whatever you're trying to push, especially in the films. Okay. So what what is KPGs? Or what you said? K EPKs. EPKs? Yeah, electronic press kit. So what are those? Are Basically, it's the bios of everybody and uh, that it's associated with the project. It's all the behind the scenes footage. It's it's a pr essentially a press release that goes out where um, they, you know, you can get a, a publicist or somebody that is going to pick that up and make sure that they syndicate it out to all of the outlets. Um, a lot of times, like if you ever watch like the, the HBO first looks or, or something like that, where they're doing interviews with the cast and the sets behind them and stuff like that, like that's all part of of the marketing aspect of it. It's all building the hype even before the movie comes out. Wow, so to anticipate sales. Yes. Wow. Okay, so, wow, so when exactly was this when you started, uh, not not when you started Agency 850, but when things really started to take effect? Mm. Um, well, it, I mean, like I said, it, it's, it started selling mobile websites. Um, but oh, no, How long ago? 
Uh, well, it was it was during 2007 when I when I moved out there. So so that was in L.A. Okay. Um, and then you know, I, I I worked in production, so I worked back and forth, right? And then and then you know the the uh, the uh, job market opened up, right? So so the strike lifted, and so um, with that, you know, just you, you kind of innovate, right? And and so my journey, how I got to Atlanta, is I actually moved back for family, so I went on hiatus from the industry for a little while. But um, when I landed, my, my family was in Florida, and uh, there was no entertainment business in the area that I was at. But one of our clients came to us to do advertising, and um, and st- he wanted to do a commercial, but he had a very obscure business. And, and I said, you know what? I could do a commercial for you. Take your money, but I won't feel comfortable with that. I was like, I jokingly, I said, let's just do a TV show because that would tell what you do. And so basically I wrote a 13 episode season on, on his particular business and like reality style, we shot the show and aired it on local TV. And instantly I found myself back in the entertainment business, but I also uncovered branded entertainment and branded entertainment is when a advertiser comes to you to create a narrative, to create a show, but it's advertising. Right. Wow. So that was the other product that I uncovered when I was out of, I wasn't even in LA at the time. I was in Northwest Florida, you know, so, um, talk, you know, innovating, always innovating, always coming up with new ideas, new concepts. And, and so that's when that end of the business really started taking off. And so product placement obviously was a natural fit. I wound up funding that project 100% on product placement. So Just actually out of pocket. Yeah. It's, you have to sometimes. It, well, but so basically my deal was, hey, let's if you backstop this pilot, I guarantee you I'm gonna be able to to find people to fund this show. So what I did was I went through the entire area and got everybody ingrained in the show. I wrote them in an episode, but they paid for that. So I was able to green light the project organically through a local community. And this is outside of Hollywood, it's outside of New York, it's outside of Atlanta, right? So with that model, um, you know, I found myself working back in the entertainment business and with everything that was going on in Atlanta and, it, you know, it was only a five hour drive for me. I wanted to check out what, you know, what the scene was. And just like I said, the, the, the entrepreneurial spirit here and, and the, just the way the industry is just kind of still molding, it was really attractive to me. So in 2017, that's when we headquartered up, up to Atlanta. And then I really got ingrained and then things started really taking off and, and you know, just doing more narratives. And, and then I got back in front of the camera. So I just just finished two roles that that, that I did recently. So it, it it was a progression. Right. And I think one of the biggest things that I like to tell people is, you know, your, your life is a journey. It's not a destination. You don't necessarily know where you're going to end up. I mean, like any journey, there's there's twists, there's turns, there's there's you know potholes in the road. You know, there there's a lot of things that you don't aren't expecting. You don't you're not expecting to happen. And so, starting out as an actor, I had no idea that my career would land me as an entrepreneur, as a serial you know serial entrepreneur and a business owner and an executive producer and and all these things and. You know, I just learned to enjoy the ride, enjoy what, what's what's the next thing and, and never give up. Continue to go after what you want. You know, I really love that motto because I feel like a lot of people have lost that yeah. with the rise of social media, with really just the entire instant gratification setup that a lot of people are so used to having. And then mm-hmm. they wonder why they have anxiety, why people are depressed, because we're, we've turned into an instant gratification society. But it's just like you said, it's all about the journey. Yeah. Wow. So. That's so interesting. So he came to you and he said, I want to do a commercial. Mm -hmm. But what was it about his business that you you just were like, I could take your money, but it's not going to be successful. Was there too much detail that a commercial just wouldn't? Like, what was it about the, his company? What company was it? You yeah, know so so uh, he he was a public adjuster. Most people don't know what a public adjuster does. So yeah. they yeah, so they basically they stand up for a homeowner in insurance claims, right? So if okay. if something happens, you know, storm comes through, rips off your roof, insurance company comes out, they give you whatever estimate they say. He essentially holds these insurance companies accountable because nine times out of 10, you know, the the homeowner doesn't know and they're going to take whatever 
the insurance company gives them. And there are, unfortunately, some insurance companies out there that do some pretty shady things. And they oh, just they lowball. Oh, they lowball. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, they lowball, they unpower, they'll just outright deny. And then the homeowner's stuck with the bag. And they, they don't, a lot of times, you know, especially in low income areas, they don't have the, the money to hire an attorney. So what uh, a public adjuster does is uh, they are an advocate for the insured. So they stand up for the homeowner and to hold them accountable. So young guy, his whole team was, you know, young, young uh, former military, you know, had a lot of energy. And so when I pitched this concept, I said, listen, this is what's going to happen when we do this. Number one, people are, it's educational, right? Because people are going to know exactly what this service is, right? Number two, it's entertaining because when I brought the when I brought the the pilot together, the battle that went back and forth uh, that he was that our our guy was pointing out statutes this insurance company didn't even know about right and and it was literally corruption was being folded on camera, so it's entertaining and number three it's advertising for his business, you know and if you notice most reality shows the dog the bounty hunter American picker storage wars cake blossom go back way back right. Um, there's a business involved. Cool. There's a business involved, right? So, so um, with that, it's advertising, but it's it's a lottery ticket for a network to come to your business and say, "Hey, we're going to do a reality show on you, so you can come to an agency like ours, and we can actually create a show around your business and then market as advertising, buy out the airtime." Wow. So, did you guys kind of make it like a thing where a homeowner got denied, and then you had someone come in to save the day yep. and Wow. Yep. Did that eventually help his business? Oh yeah. It obviously yeah, did. Yeah. I mean, like I said, and and we we bought out airtime on on you know ABC, CW, and Fox, and we got some really good time slots. And if it looks like a national show and it's on a national you know station, and the business is local, everybody's gonna be like, "Who is this guy? Well, look at this business! Like they're in our own backyard. Let's give them a call." So the strategy behind it was, I was like, you know, hey, if you have an, you know, at the end of every episode, it's like if you have an insurance claim or you'd like to be on the show, call this number. So there was a lead gen aspect to it as well. So when I approach a project, I always think outside the box. I always think about how can we how can we maximize what we're trying to do here. And and for him, it was exposure. Chris, that is genius. I don't think I've even, I don't know if I've even heard of that model being used today. So he turned a reality show into a commercial. So I bet people were kicking down his door after that, but I bet right. people were kicking down your door. Yeah. So how how did that kind of blow up for you? Because I know people mm -hmm. were like, whoa, I need my business ad for, advertised in this way. Yeah. Because it's the thing about a TV show, the thing about, I mean, even a movie, it's, sometimes it's not long enough, but spe specifically a TV show. You have an emotional attachment with the characters, yes. right? And if at the end of every episode, wow, that's genius. Yep, I've never thought about that. The the biggest buying signal the, is is people don't necessarily remember the they don't want to be sold. That's the first thing, right? They want to remember how they felt when they watched it. And if you can tap into somebody's emotion, you're gonna have an effective project or an effective commercial. So like even commercials that that will do. Um, all my guys are film guys. We take more of the emotional approach because after watching a commercial, if that left an impact on you or a show, you're going to remember that. Of course. Right? And that's more effective, especially if you're trying to advertise to somebody, if you're trying to market you market a product or service to them. Wow. Okay. So then you said that, th that you transitioned that into going on to do two more. You, you said you did two... Yeah, so there's other projects that that we've worked on in branded entertainment. There's a couple of projects that that. Oh no, um, you were on them. You were on the shows. You said you had two two roles. Uh, not on that show. No, no, that was. It was after that. Yeah, these are narrative shows. Okay. Um, so so yeah, so I had a um a couple of roles, you know, on um so I had movies and and some a series that that we're working on too. So can't really talk too much about because they're still in post. Okay. Um, but but yeah, so that that kind of kind of found its way back, I guess, into my life as well. You know, it really is interesting to see that you've touched every aspect up until this point of entertainment industry, yeah. right? Because yeah. I mean, you did, you tried to, well, not tried, but you did act, then the marketing, then production. Now you're back in front of the camera, reality show. Ah, that's just, it's full just circle. Yeah, it's full circle. <laughs> I always, I tell, I tell anybody that, that steps into the industry, try to learn everything like you don't have to be an expert in everything but try to learn everything don't don't just 
have one thing, you know, just it, it, it makes you more rounded, right? But you also understand what everybody else does on set. And that's important. It's important to kind of know why you need to be facing this way, why you need to, you know, address, uh, you know, a character this way, why you need to walk across the table and cross this way because, you know, something's blocking the shot or whatever, right? You, it's good for you to understand these things. It's good for you to understand the marketing behind it. It's good for you to kind of understand it. Don't be a one pony show, you know, understand a little bit more uh, than the next person because the you know, if you're just going in for one spot, you're limiting yourself and you may uncover something else that you may have a passion for. I never knew I would enjoy the business end of acting so much as, as, as I did till I stepped behind the camera, you know, which makes sense as an entrepreneur, it's all business, right? And it's show business. So when it came to, you know, structuring a show and financing and packaging and distribution and all that stuff, these are things I, I've kind of built along the way. So then when I was like, wow, I could actually make money making movies and making shows it's, it's pretty attractive dream. yeah it's a dream oh, wow so you've, you've been in this for over a decade now yeah so it, it's, it's 2020 yours kind of been weird it's been weird in my own life it's been weird in, in the world but there's no energy that's permanent you know 2020 is going to turn out to be a great year i am prophesizing right for someone right now who's thinking not necessarily to start an entertainment company or to start a marketing company but it's just beginning their journey mm -hmm. down whatever path it may be. Just, just you know, for the situation, we're going to say entertainment. What do you think is the mindset that they should try to have to ultimately be successful? And once again, to define success, that's its own thing. But in terms of getting out there, getting the right experience, and not necessarily wasting time. What I'm trying to say is I feel like a lot of people, they want to pursue acting. I've heard so many people say, oh, I'd love to be an actor. My dream's to... But, but they never do anything. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to even put one foot down and then the next one in. What are some of the things that people can do to get involved? If they want to start, whether it is an entertainment company or if they're just an aspiring actor, how do you get out there mm -hmm. nowadays? It's changed so well, much. Well, you hit the nail on the head, right? They never get started. You, you got to get started okay. and, and, and not put it off, right? So you could always say, oh, I'm going to start next week. Why start next week? Start now. Because the quicker today, right, right now, just do it, right? Because the longer you keep pushing it, the the longer, or it may never even happen, right? So just get started, and I think that's the biggest thing. It's you know because I talk to a lot of people about their personal brand and pushing their brand, and and like they want to start a podcast and all this other stuff. Just do it. Like, what are you waiting for? You know, are you waiting for you know the perfect light, or you want to lose ten pounds before you get on camera? Yeah, it's right. ridiculous. It's like just do it. Yeah. Because it's pushing content. That's what it's all about. You know, and and like I said before, for the actor or above the line talent, especially if you're in front of the camera. Push content, get content going, and you can start without waiting for Paramount or somebody to call you. You can do it now, you know. So, I think stop making excuses, uh, you know, and and stop putting things off, and then also stay stay consistent. Stay, don't give up, you know. I mean, if you you have your heart set on something, continue to go after. Like I said, it's a journey. It's a journey, not a destination. Life is a journey. You have your mindset on 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 your this goal that you want to go after. Take the journey. You don't know which way it's going to turn. You may uncover something that you loved even more than what your extreme passion was. You never know. And 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 you you touched on this too. Is success success? I believe is happiness. Yeah, that's what success truly is. You know, for some people, that's forty thousand dollars a year, or sixty thousand dollars a year, and vacation time. You know. And they're the most happiest people on the planet. There's people out there that are making hundreds of millions of dollars that are miserable. It's happiness. Go after the happiness. Don't chase the dollar. Go after happiness. And 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 the 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 other things you will welcome into your life uh, to make. You know, I think this is one of the biggest things is most people are striving for peace in their life and happiness. Focus on those things. And 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 when you find the career that you absolutely love doing. Now you have peace and happiness in what you do day to day, which has been your dream. Okay, so you mentioned something really important, and it's something we talk about a lot on the show. So it's really funny that you said that, but it's the fact that people think that success is a financial goal. Mm -hmm. And 
the, the problem is, and I want to ask you this specifically because this is your field, right? Do you think that subconsciously in media, in music, in movies, that they're kind of pushing this narrative that they're trying to set life up in a way to make people think that they don't have the answers that they need for their problems. They have to go buy a product. They have to go buy a service. They have to buy a course, buy a plan and sign up for Do, do you think that not only that, that can be destructive, of course, but is that something that is subconsciously pushed in media that you kind of it's, it's just I you know, it's weird to say this because it's not evil, but it's that whole narrative that you need some some product or you need to buy this or and that's kind of pushed in, in music. Like a lot of the rappers talk about all these girls or the, the girl rappers talk about all the guys they're with and all the cars and the money. But in reality, these people are getting married. These These people are paying month to month for, you know, a Mustang, a Corolla. They don't have the Lambo. They're renting them for the videos. Right. But it's misleading a lot of people to go set their lives up incorrectly to ruin relationships, to think that they need to buy a Gucci belt or like you said, I need to lose 10 pounds or it's not until you said Paramount or whatever mm-hmm. company calls me that I can start acting. It's kind of ruining people's idea of how basic and simple things are. Like this conversation right here, it's, yep. it's, it's, it is what it is. Yep. And people add too much to it. Do you think that the, 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 not the media, not the entertainment, but the entire film entertainment industry. Do you think it kind of subconsciously pushes that genre? You know, I mean, perception is everything. And and there are. There are a lot of people out there. That, I mean, and you have these influencers, right, that are going to a Ferrari dealership and posing next to a Ferrari on the lot and taking a picture. Like, that's – it's you're faking it. Like, and, and eventually that's going to – that's going to come out. Right. And, and it's not organic. It's not real. It's fake. It's, it's, it's not really, um, it's people think that, that that's what they, they're supposed to do. What I believe is just be real, be genuine, especially if you're pushing content, people can read through that, you know, and there's, there's, there's a timeline to that. You know, we always talk about, you know, the, the, the economy has been great. You know, it, it really has for the past, you know, 10 years or so it's, it's been great. Thank God. Yeah. But, it something's going to happen like you know Retail. exactly and and so so a lot of these influencers a lot of these people that are faking it that are living like paycheck to paycheck just so they could ride around in a ferrari or, or take these exotic vacations to make their profiles look good what happens when everything crashes and those ad dollars that those those advertisers are paying are drying up because let me tell you being being in advertising for so long the first thing that people cut is advertising spend when the market crashes. The smart advertisers keep it because they can capitalize on the market, but most advertisers cut back on spend. And what's going to happen to these influencers that are faking it, you're going to be left with nothing. Yeah, you're going to be getting repossessed. Repossessed. Take a picture next to the repossessed. Exactly. <laughs> so That's crazy. Yeah, yeah I... It really is interesting. It's always weird how the people who are at the top of their game and, you know, just from even doing the podcast, right? It's always the most successful people, the people with the biggest following that have shown me the most love, that have put me on their Instagram story that have, hey, go check out the episode we did here with Charbel. And and it's so weird how the people that aren't doing as well, they don't want to repost things. They don't want to engage. They, they want to act like they never even did the podcast mm-hmm. or, or shot the commercial or whatever it is. And it's that same idea that they're so worried about what society is going to think or, oh, this person doesn't have the following and I have these many likes and so I can't associate here or there. I just think that's such a negative mindset. Yeah. And I'm glad that you agree. Oh, because, yeah, 100%. Yeah, but you, you also mentioned something else that was really interesting about perception being everything, right? How do you guys play on that idea when you're when you're shooting a film, just from a general sense? Do you guys understand that well, not do you understand, but do you have to understand that there's different levels or are you guys just trying to push a general message and assuming it'll be received in different ways? So when creating content. Yeah, you, like a movie. Yeah. So you need to understand who your audience is. So you have to? There's yes. no way to just. No. Well, you, you would never want to just push any product and just hope people buy it, whether it's a you know, a product that, that you, you, you're creating or it's a movie, right? That, that it's still, a, it's still a product, right? And you have to understand who your market is. So if it's a movie that we're talking about, then I need to know who, who is, who is my audience? Who is this? Who, what did I make this for? What's, what's the market? What's the market cap? Like what's like how many people are out there? Is it very, very, 
very very niche, right? Oh, okay. Or is it is it a bigger audience? Is it a, is it a, um you know a, a rom com, a romantic comedy? Is it is it an action film? These are different markets, right? So understanding your market, uh, you know, you're gonna want that because that's the that's your only outlet. Okay, so then you guys, well, not you guys, you, you take the information and you're like, okay, this is our market. This is what these people from what statistics say that, you know, the stats, this is what has worked. This is what hasn't worked. So you guys just try to take your original narrative and push it in a certain direction that will reach that audience. Correct. Yeah. I like it. Okay. Yeah. And and you can, you can look back on history, you know, um, <laughs> Except there are there are some filmmakers that come to me and be like, "This is the next Blair Witch," or "This is the you know the 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 projects that like were made for like ten thousand dollars and just made hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars." Like those are few and far between. Those are like unicorns. Like you know, it, 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 let's get real. Like what are real comparables to your film? Understanding what the real comparables are, and then and then uh, and then be able to to put your movie in that you know, in that classification to get real numbers of what it could do. Wow. Well, Chris, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, yep. I know you guys are limited on time. You guys have to go to a meeting, but just before, uh, you know, we close this one out, I just want you to know that everyone that's tuning in here today, they support you and they want to get involved. So if you just want to take a moment real quick, shout out all the Instagram pages, all the, you know, Facebook pages, websites, how people can a follow and support and, you know, get involved. Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow me at Chris de Blasio or Chris de Blasio fan, depending on what platform you use. I'm on all of them. Uh, and then the company is agency 850. So agency 850.com uh, is the website. And uh, I look forward to connecting. I answer all my DMs. So I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any other questions that are out there. Well, hey, Chris, uh, we know you're a very busy man. I just yeah. want to go ahead and thank you for your time. Yeah, man. But, um, you know, I'm Sharbal Milan. Today we got Chris de Blasio. And this has been a time shared. Thank you so much.